Today's episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Albert Lee Seed. Here at Back to the Roots, it is our goal to create connections with organic farmers across the country. Now we'd like to connect you with a leading provider of organic and non-GMO farm seed and Albert Lee Seed. Cover crops, forages, small grains, corn, and soybeans. Albert Lee Seed is helping organic and transitioning farmers diversify their crop rotations and create healthy herds, healthy soil, and healthy humans. Whether you're looking for organic oats for cover cropping, highly digestible alfalfa, or a 105-day non-GMO corn hybrid, Albert Lee has got you covered. In fact, they were the first farm seed company in the industry to offer guaranteed levels of non-GMO purity in their Viking corn and soybean line. Check out their website at www.alseed.com to see their farm seed lineup or to request a catalog. And thank you to Albert Lee Seed. everybody this is brian wood with back to the roots podcast just wanted to start with an explanation of today's episode today we have wendell berry wes jackson and david klein who had a conversation together at the oak conference which is the organic association of kentucky where this was the keynote address for the night Uh, they had a conversation that was moderated by rona roberts who is a radio host from Louisville, Kentucky. And we really do appreciate the um, Oak Conference for allowing Mike and I to record this conversation. Mike and I were not a part of the conversation. We were just listening. Um, But if you'd like to hear Mike and I have conversations with each of these guys individually, Wendell, Wes, and David, you can look back in the podcast feed or go to our website and listen to individual episodes uh, with each of these guys. I do just want to give a quick warning that at the for the first five minutes, uh, we had some audio difficulties, uh, so it may be a little uh, faint coming through, but after about five minutes, you'll notice a difference. I did have to chop out about 10 minutes of the conversation uh, because of distortion, and it just wasn't coming through all right. So you'll notice at about the five minute mark, uh, the volume may go up a little bit, um, but everything should come through just fine. So we appreciate you listening and thank you so much. Since I first heard about this agrarian conversation, I've been looking forward to it. And I've got to say it's true for everyone in the room. Dave Klein, Wendell Berry, and Wes Jackson, it's a wonder and a gift to all of us that you could be here together. Can I'm trying to find the right spot. Where is it? Right here? <laughs> um, so you've come from Ohio, from Henry County, Kentucky, from Kansas, for this agrarian conversation. We welcome you with all our hearts. The conference program includes short biographies for each of these three incomparable leaders. And the on-site conference bookstore has their invaluable guidance available in published form for not very much money. So think about that and patronize the bookstore. Let's move forward. And inspire thousands to enter and continue lives dedicated to stewardship of soil and the Earth's resources. Your examples influence our work our commitment to community, and the values of people in this room and around the world. So we are curious, what inspires you? David, we'll start with you. I'd rather go last. (laughs) But what inspires me? You know, uh, are we working? We Mine's don't working. To, we don't know what to do. Okay, is this working? Oh. Oh, the wonders of technology. There's a green light. Is that supposed to work? <laughs> oh. 
Okay, now. Yeah, am I on? Okay, okay. Uh, I'll just hold this on my lap here, then it might work instead of my pocket. What inspires me? Well, for one thing, is the seasons. As we all know, we're getting into the spring of the year, and we're getting through winter, and I always say February has 28 days. And we all say the, the farmer, on the first day of February, half of his feet should still be left over. So the, so the livestock can, that's in our area, which is, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> it never fails. <laughs> it's so satisfactory. <laughs> David, David, he needs to grab the microphone. Uh, David, grab the microphone right here, there. Okay, I think I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> of course, it's easy. But also, what is probably the greatest inspiration for me is to see young people in farming. <clears throat> I think Joel Salon said years ago that if we really want a sustainable agriculture, we need to have young people in farming. And I think that is, uh, uh, to me, one of the most inspiring things is to see young people. And very, very fortunately, uh, we have quite a few small-scale organic farmers in our community. Mike, how many? A hundred of them. So they're, they're all, you know, the organic prices aren't what they were, but they're still good. And, and they're still doing well. And it's, uh, it's just simply, we have, uh, we have conventional dairy farmers that are leaving, and it's, I um, always say, once the cow leaves the farm, she seldom returns. Because we've had farms that have been dairy ever since well in the 1800s, and the cows are leaving. And that is a sad, sadness to me. But to see the young people have meetings, be enthusiastic about farming, and then go out and do it, that is really, to me, inspiring. Wendell Berry, what inspires you? Oh, I believe in inspiration. Um, I take it pretty seriously. I thought I was doing all right. You have, um, to, you have to wool it occasionally here. Oh. I don't think the handheld one's working either. There's a it's on. There. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the system is not working. Well. Oh, you can give it back to me. What it's about this? Oh, there. there it goes. What about this? We're on. Too loud. Now. Too loud. <laughs> Well, by, by our age, if there are no young people coming on, it would just be terrible. At the point that we talked about earlier, and ask you to build on that a little, and then I'll come back and ask David the same. From inspiration to aspiration, you're, you're right there on it. How good can this work of sustainable agriculture get? What's possible with appropriate priorities, effort, and policies? Well, it can get a lot better than it is, <laughs> as we all know. Um, here's what I've been thinking. I've been looking at the history of the exiles of the Jews into Babylon, which happened, they took kind of the cream of the crop and the Jews were constantly asking, how did we displease God? Uh, then there comes another exile uh, somewhat later. This time they come in and they just wipe out everything. And now the prophets are asking, what can I do as an individual? And in a certain sense, that's a fallback position that rather than think about what can we all collectively do, sometimes we give up and say, well, at least I'll take care of my own little piece. I think we can't do that. Uh, it's got to be both the individual and the group uh, to get connected. Uh, I have nothing against the minor prophets. 
uh, they've given us an awful lot of <laughs> fine stuff. But and, uh, certainly nothing against the major prophets that have given us a lot of fine stuff. Well, we got to combine those two. And I think that too much of our movement has been just satisfied, well, I'm going to do what I can. And it's got to be more than that. I think we've got to do a better job at organizing. And I don't know how to do it, but I think we can if we decide to. Thank you. David, would you be interested in wading in on this question of how good it can get? What is possible to reach for? I think Wes answered for me, too, uh, as far as, yes, we've got to do, you know, I pick up the trash along the road. I sweep in front of my door. I mow the bull thistles and the Canada thistles under the fences. We've got to do that, but I think we have to think on a larger you know, I, I'm, I'm maybe what Emerson said, a man standing in his own field is unable to see it. I'm very, very close to maybe my vision is very local. I don't know, but we definitely have to work together to um, make things better for, for a sustainable long-term agriculture. Okay. Well... It seems to me that there's no limit on goodness because God is good. So uh, no matter how good you think you are, you can always get better. Evil is always limited, as Shakespeare and others have pointed out. It destroys itself. It destroys its own means, it may destroy a lot of stuff with it, uh, but uh, it, it comes to the end. I don't know. I think um, there's plenty of organization going on already as far as I'm concerned. Now, uh, Wes will have something to say about that. But uh, what I'm grateful for is to have work to do every day. I think that's what keeps me going and uh, the feeling that it's my own work and it's given to me to do and I ought to do it is... Uh, it's just a great thing. Maybe that's inspiring to me. Did you want to respond to Wendell? <laughs> <coughs> well, I'll talk about the 50-year farm bill sometime in the like course you. of all this. I'd but like you to. I don't need to right now. Go, go right ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, Wendell and I and Fred Kirschman took a 50-year farm bill to Washington. And there was even an article in uh, a piece we put in the New York Times on the opinion page. It got a little bit of a flurry, uh, but it didn't happen. But a lot of what that farm bill is about is grassing down a lot of uh, the corn and soybean acreage and get it planted to grass and eventually uh, more of our perennial grain polycultures we now have a uh, perennial grain, our Kernza, uh, is now um, expanding, and a sorghum, we have perennial sorghum in um, Africa, and then we've uh, actually managed to uh, get going the perennial rice in uh, China. And there's thousands of acres of perennial rice now. Uh, so if we can begin to save the soil, uh, I think we can begin then to save our souls, too, by the way. But uh, uh, there's, I mentioned those 20-some elements uh, that go into life. And uh, so the 50-year farm bill is devoted to saving what we might call the ecological capital and at the same time sequestering carbon and preventing so much carbon input and then kind of one swipe, agriculture, I think, stands the biggest chance uh, of doing something about climate change simply by, you know, good, sustainable farming. Uh, land use is number two as a source of greenhouse gases. Behind power plants and the head of all, um, transportation. Uh, and agriculture is actually the major uh, contributor 
to uh, greenhouse gases within the land use category. So we can do something about that just by uh, better farming. And so uh, I think from um, what we're hoping is that this uh, green uh, this uh, Green New Deal may have some room for um, uh, our 50-year farm bill. And if it doesn't, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll see. But uh, we now have something uh, that we can talk about. Um, you know, if you want to get some good long, uh, long stem ale, you can buy it in California. If you want to... Uh, uh, that we got to start with what's basic, I guess, is the alcohol. Uh, so anyway, there's there's some things happening, and um, I think that um, we just need to keep on keeping on. Well, implicit in that farm bill is the idea that a lot of people are going to have to go back to work. Right. On the land, in on the country, doing what daily, what is asked of them. Yeah. And uh, nature. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. We're looking at, uh, in some respects, <laughs> all this acreage. I mean, right now there's a farm in Kansas that's 30,000 acres. Um, and uh, I think we're going to see a new kind of uh, Homestead Act someday because we've got to increase the re relationship between people and land. Uh, and uh, you can't have that kind of acreage unless you got a lot of fossil fuel. Without fossil fuel, we got plenty of people to keep us fed. What was this term you, you were using earlier, eyes to acres? Was that your term, Wendell? Who, who yeah, used that term? eyes to yep. acres ratio, eyes to acres yeah. Ratio. yeah. Okay. Wendell, I'm going to let you be first this time um, on this question. Change the focus a little bit. Inspiration may not be quite enough when a crop fails, when customers and markets turn away, as corporate consolidation continues and development keeps smothering prime agricultural land, and climate change overwhelms all we have learned. All of us struggle at times and sometimes for years at a stretch to stick with our principles and practices while still keeping a roof on the house and meeting our family's needs. What have been your biggest challenges? Well, of course, it's uh, tempting sometimes to give up and say, well, nothing can be done. Um, but uh, I don't, uh, I've never had a kind of a crisis or a challenge of that kind. And some days are better than others. But that's where having work comes in. That uh, if, if the world is ending, uh, you still got your work. And these people who are milking cows and, and uh, taking care of livestock know what I'm talking about. They're, they're under contract with those creatures. And they're expected um, to do their duty. And uh, when that's the situation, when you have your duty to do, then you become eligible to enjoy doing it. And uh, so I don't think that um, it's appropriate to, to um, have too big a challenge. Um, because there's always something to do. Now I can't, I must um, say something about that. I'm not a farmer. Um, so I, I can't speak as a farmer. You're asking, that question implies a little bit that I'm a farmer. Um, I have a very, uh, well rather a, a ridiculous farm uh, I've done a lot of work on it, and I've enjoyed it a great deal. But most people wouldn't farm a place like mine. It's uh, uh, steep and broken up and 
and uh, the whatever whatever isn't too steep is too low and it floods so uh, all my farm has done is to keep me busy <laughs> for which I'm thankful I mean we've we've produced stuff uh, but we haven't depended on producing it um, it's been there having that place has given me many times um, more enjoyment than most people would get out of it. I've had a hell of a good time. Um, but it's also put me there with my neighbors and I've done a lot of work with my neighbors. And they, when, we, when we still had a neighborhood, uh, we were in each other's fields all the time and in each other's company and having a good time that way too. Um, I don't know, the, I keep coming back in my mind now because I'm so grateful to have work to do. Uh, I think it's just just uh, keeping me going. My daddy used to like to remember his daddy telling him, the day after I die, get up and go to work. <laughs> and I think that's the right, right advice. Okay, so I'm, I, will, I was planning to come back around and say, and then what sustains you through dark times, but it may make sense for you to answer these questions. The times are always dark. Yeah. It's dark as hell right now. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to, it depends on where you put your mind. There's always a better argument for giving up. Mm -hmm. the, the, the desperate always have the argument won because all you've got to do is to say, well, look at me. I'm happy, I'm, uh, I've got these little jobs to do and I'm tickled to death. That's all, that's all you can say back to them. Look at this, Let's look at this, look at this. this is, look at this world that we, we're in. There's always enough goodness and beauty in it to keep somebody going. Goodness and beauty. I mean, I depend a lot on butterflies and flowers and Cheap stuff. <laughs> Cheap. Uh, the, the idea is to not ever let your pleasures become very expensive. And then it's everywhere, the stuff you need. Thank you. Wes, your, what have been your biggest challenges and what sustains you through dark times? Oh, well, <clears throat> my biggest challenges <laughs> Raising money to support a nonprofit organization in Kansas <laughs> uh, uh, to do something that the majority of scientists thought was impossible, uh, which is uh, to develop perennial grain mixtures that would be grown in, uh, that would be uh, uh, using nature's uh, prairie as a, a standard or a measure. Uh, so that's been a challenge. But um, I've also been really blessed. Um, the scientists that we have at the Land Institute, um, we didn't have any much money. And uh, they came anyway. And I told them two things. You don't have to publish and I'll raise the money. And as a consequence now, they publish and are actually raising some money for their own research. And they've discovered uh, a big thing, I think. Why our ancestors never developed perennial grains <laughs> and why we can now. And that's, I think, a big thing. Uh, they also are work on a global inventory for other perennials now that we know and they um, also have, we're putting on another meeting this one in in um, Sweden um, called ecological intensification and there'll be scientists there 150 of them from um, six continents and uh, so but it started with people that had only one thing to do and that stick 
to the mission. And they've, they've, they've got a very different mindset than the kind of university professors that we usually have. So I've been terribly inspired by this group of young scientists that uh, are now uh, able to support, I think, something like 20 graduate students and postdocs at different places around, and there's getting a little bit of momentum. And uh, so these are, these are not the kind of scientists that were just throwing their papers into the winds of science. They are, they see you as their constituency. Um, so did I answer the question or did I just have senile rapture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've taken your licks and they have too, but you've always been at work. Yeah. It's something you wanted to do. Yeah. Always. Well, we had people that ate out of the dumpsters and roadkill. We had, uh, there wasn't a lot of that, but there was enough of it, because uh, it didn't take much. Uh, but uh, this has been, uh, this is a team uh, in which there are folk that, um, they, they were always there. They were always there. Uh, I spent enough time in universities to know that they're different. And they're different because they're devoted to a sustainable agriculture and culture. And they have a sense enough to know that you don't create an agriculture of sustainability uh, as a satellite and expect it to safely orbit the extractive economy. They also know that we've got to start living within our means and recognize limits and put a cap on carbon. And eventually, perhaps soon, not perhaps, eventually have rationing if we're to get our acts together. So the age of the recognition of limits, that's what our gang is about. And that's tough. I mean, you're, we're getting a lot of pushback on all that. But the, in a sense, the genie's out of the bottle because we can now look to agriculture as a kind of a, as a <coughs> metaphor for what we have to do. Farmers recognize limits. And uh, we got to, we know that we've got to end growth. And we've got to acknowledge that soil is more important than oil and as much of a non-renewable resource as oil. So uh, that I'll end up giving a sermon if I'm not careful and I, yeah. It's a good one. Yeah, okay. Thank you. David, what have been your biggest challenges and what sustained you through dark times? Our farm, my grandfather bought our farm in May 1918. It was still during World War I. Prices were good. I won't get into that though, but our farm has been in our family now for 100 years. I think Ann and Kevin's children are, would be like the fifth or sixth generation, and we've never yet had to depend on all farm income to support the farm. So we've never really had, and this again is due uh, largely to <coughs> our farm went organic, and uh, we were, we've been certified since since 2000, organic since 97, almost organic for decades before that. But we had no markets. And so because of that, our farm is still providing a good livelihood for our daughter and son-in-law and their grandchildren. And that, <coughs> I must say, we've never really hit a dark area in our farm life. We have people in our community that are conventional dairies, so as I said before, they are at the point where they, mm -hmm. they can't make it. Uh, we have farms in our neighborhood that is basically, I told Elsie, as far as that farm is, they're probably earning very little from the farm and are working off farm to bring in cash. So that, as said, but as, as I, I'm with Wendell here, 
uh, and as Wes said, live within our means. Our daughter, I, I once gave a little talk at a financial meeting, and once the, <clears throat> once the children got over laughing, I, I must confess I'm not a very good bean counter. Uh, I'm like my father was. He said when he loaned somebody $1,000 during the Depression, he couldn't pay it back. My dad just, this, I wasn't born yet. He just laughed. He said, well, we'll make another thousand. And he just, and actually when he was dying in 1993, he confessed to my mother. He said, there's one guy I gave a loan and never paid it back. So he was just, uh, so he was never, he was never negative even about the depression. So take, sim, uh, take pleasure in low cost things. Just like Wendell said. The migration of tundra swans. There's a, we have a strong migration in the spring and fall of many birds, and we have nesting birds, we have butterflies. And I said, it, sometimes it'd almost be easy to say, hey, I give up, but I almost did with bees. I've been a beekeeper since, my grandfathers were beekeepers, my dad was a beekeeper, sort of a beekeeper. I was, a, I, we've had bees since 1974, and in the winter of 17 and 18, they all died. The first time it ever happened. And I almost gave up, but I just couldn't. We got bees. Uh, they are surviving so far this winter. We have discovered mason bees that do an excellent job of pollinating in orchards, uh, even superior to the honeybee. It's just simple pleasures, and there's always discovery. I like what Rachel Carson said, the sense of wonder. You never go out working in a field, or like Wendell said, walking in the woods, you don't make those little discoveries. And they're so delightful. Uh, seeing a lee shrew, I've seen two in my lifetime, and they're both in this last year. They're just tiny. But that just gave me tremendous pleasure, Wendell. As I think you read in Revelations, God created the earth for his pleasure. Martin Luther has a little different spin on it, but... <clears throat> uh, he was too practical for that. Uh, but Martin Luther also said, I would plant the tree today if I knew the world would end tomorrow. So that's, uh, I think, is it Proverbs we read that, <coughs> that, that the, and I'm translating here from Luther, is that the righteous falls seven times and gets up and continues. And we have all experienced that. Well, the unrighteous person falls and remains flat. He, he just gives up. So he can't give up. As, as we say, I think we can all confess there is more right still than wrong. There are still more nicer people than bad people. So I have to remind myself constantly to focus on that. And as I, as I, had a, as I have a friend who came to our people from the Catholic tradition, and he's just such a positive person, lives in North Carolina, and he said, David, there's much more right than wrong. Let's focus on that and then work on what's wrong. So I think that's what we maybe tried to come from is work on what's wrong. We have to. We have no choice. It's our responsibility. Sorry for the long answer. Your book, The Round of a Country Year, is a happy book. Oh, it is. And it's all about help. How often do you need help when you don't find it? Yeah. There's always help. There's always help there. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I always like... And it's 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 nice to being around people who are smarter than you are. You have you can ask them questions, and they can give you an answer. You're talking about your grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they think I walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's build on where you've taken us. We so often, all of us in this room, find ourselves in settings like this one. We have been fortunate to be around you and to be moved and inspired by your examples to make changes in our own lives and work harder for change in our society and culture. So we are prone to ask you, so what should I do? What will make the most difference? We've listened and learned enough to know better than to expect easy answers. It probably won't be enough to switch to reusable shopping bags, but that is worth doing. You have each talked about two factors, talked, written, spoken, taught, about two factors 
that contribute to long-term, widespread, positive change. The first is acknowledging and living within limitations. limitations. The second is taking an active part in loving community. Let's start with limitations. Limitations can apply at the personal level, at the home economy level, on individual farms, and public policies also can be built appropriately on limitations. Let's start with you, Wes. Where would you encourage us to work on limitations and how? My head's humming like a beehive right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> uh, trying to think of, <laughs> of where to begin. We have uh, time. So acknowledging that the clock is moving. Uh, I think the world has been and always will be more beautiful than useful. That utility uh, is a derivative of beauty. And we tend to, I mean, there's plenty of ugly around. Uh, and I spent a couple of weeks in China, and there are an awful lot of people in China. Uh, and there's an awful lot of the products of the Industrial Revolution in China, just as here. But even there, uh, where there's well over, well over a billion people, uh, there's, and here is a repressive communist regime. Even there, uh, the folks have a way of finding the pleasure in their places. And some of those places, I'm telling you, one of these tables is a rice paddy. <laughs> and then over here is another one, maybe two tables, a rice paddy. And then a water buffalo there. But there is something of the spirit that's alive under communism and too many people and it, that spirit that I see, that I was around, I, I was on a, uh, from literally near Vietnam all the way into outer Mongolia, or inner Mongolia, as a, mostly at agriculture research stations. But along the way is a spirit that I see is common with an awful lot of folk that I know that are associated with agriculture. So I think that, and by the way, I had a grandson along who was at that time 16, and uh, he was getting ready for the debate season that had to do with trade with China. And while my wife and I were just delighted and singing the praises, he was reminding us of the repressive regimes and how everything is bad here and there and yon that he was getting out of his preparing for the <laughs> year of debate. Well, I felt like the child <laughs> and while well, he's telling all of this. Uh, but it struck me that there is the, yeah, a reality that he's talking about, but there is also this other reality of the kind of uh, pleasure that's there in the world. That was good for me. Um, even though my grandson was the adult on the trip, uh, as we're singing the praises, he's reminding us of the realities. So uh, this is an odd thing, isn't it? <laughs> that uh, we can see the news, and uh, at the same time, we can go outside and we can be engaged in our work. Uh, and that's a kind of a mystery, in a way, uh, that I still haven't figured out. Enough? Yeah, is that enough? I, I mean, I have a You'll whole bunch more chance. to say. I'd like to talk <laughs> about the Divine Comedy if I could, but I'll save that until later. Um, 
David, um, where would you encourage us to work on limitations and how? I feel a little bit awkward, you know, where we are to tell you how to live. But what, uh, I didn't finish my statement when I was asked to give that talk on Amish economics. Um, our daughter told me, Dad, just tell them to live just beneath their means, and then it'll always reach. <laughs> and, and that was fun. And, and I was tell now this is what I would tell our young people when we gave them instructions before they're married, they call it called the marriage duties, huh. um, is try to limit your automatic monthly payments to as low as you can. Uh, <clears throat> we have, I'm gonna say Elsie and I, uh, I think we make three monthly payments. One is we have one credit card. Uh, we have the phone that we, we share, our share of the phone, and the natural gas bill, which is a gas line. That's all the payments. So keep your payments as low as you can. And also, um, as again, just getting back to buy local, enjoy local nature. This being, uh, my dad never saw the Grand Canyon. He never saw any parts of the West. He lived to be 87. I don't think he felt deprived at all because there was so much to see at home. There was simply, there was so much. Um, for you, yes, I, I carry a shopping bag too. Uh, to town, just hold it, you stuff it in here. And, and also, uh, I, sh I have to tell you about Elsie, my wife. She is, <coughs> she is the epitome of conservatism as far as <laughs> household. She has, as far as canned goods, buying things in a can, well under two gallons a year of empty cans. There just aren't any. Uh, we, have, we go, we have jars in the basement, we have everything, and as, I'm just like, well, I'm just extremely grateful for what we have and for the pleasures we share and for the, uh, for the I said, the laughter we have. And, I'm just grateful for my family. So I, 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 I don't want to tell you to buy a horse and buggy. Um, <laughs> this is my only suit. Hey, it works. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I think there was an article in the Small Farmers Journal years ago, I don't know who wrote it, but said, I think somebody had maybe joined the Amish. He said, if we're doing things that you can copy and apply to your own life, that makes us happy, but not, we're not telling you to do it. You know, that's, that's your decision. We're very happy, we're very aware of why we're doing this, and it's uh, uh, many miles along our roads have no electric wires. As Wes said, we put up with a lot of ugliness for comfort. So we have, our community has never gone to all electric, so we have many miles and miles of no electricity, no electrical lines, just the openness is just, a little bit hard for the kestrels to find places to perch, but outside of that, <laughs> it's, it's nice. So, you know, I don't want to be preaching here. Excuse me. No, we, we're inviting it. <laughs> Wendell, limitations? Well, if you've ever been outsmarted by a sheep, <laughs> you know something about your limitations. <laughs> I've been outsmarted by sheep fairly often in my life. Um... But this is a serious business. I, um, a lot of my uh, thinking about things uh, has depended for many years on what uh, they call the chain of being, sometimes the great chain of being. It's been forgotten, but the chain of being is a chain. It, Inter, it's a, a system of interconnections. And um, God is at the top and down through the orders of the angels to humans. And then down through the orders of animals until they get so small. As Alexander Pope says, no glass can show them and no eye can see them. The important thing about that is that it defines the human limits. 
We're between the angels and the animals. That's our limit, to be human. And the trick is, well, the, uh, the difficulty of that is that it's awfully tempting to us humans to become superhuman. We're not advertising much about human limits now in our culture as it is. But we would like to be superhuman in some circumstances, and in others we'd like to be subhuman. The problem is there that uh, neither of those is a, is a possibility. You don't become an animal by wishing to be one. You become a monster of a certain kind. And you don't become superhuman. You don't become an angel. You don't become as God, to quote Genesis. Um, you become a monster of another kind. And a lot of our literature charts the ruin that follows those ambitions. So this carries down into everything. Everything has a limit past which it can't thrive. And our world may be at that limit, but the way we learn about it is to see that our pasture is at that limit. It can't thrive with more grazers. That's about, that's about it. Uh, you can't make anything without accepting a limit. Um, the arts are full of that, but you've always got to know what the limits are that you're working in, the size of the field. Um, that means that uh, you can either mow all of it or half of it. You, if you don't figure out what the limit of the mowing is, then you're in trouble harvesting the hay. So the, the issue of limits is everywhere, and we're taught we're teaching our children, our poor children, that you can be anything you can be. That means you don't have any limits. That's a terrible, cruel thing to tell a child. And it goes on from there. I think uh, a lot of people in the United States think that they're, if they just get the breaks, they'll be a billionaire. But there's limits there. Where? Wes had an argument one time that if you had a billion dollars, the only way you could keep it out of trouble, that is from doing damage, would be to throw it away. I don't know whether he believes that anymore or not. He'd like the Land Institute to have a billion dollars, I think. But <laughs> maybe he doesn't believe it, but I believe it. I don't think that the human creature is smart enough to keep up with a billion dollars. And I'll give you an example. Some people came to see me one time and they wanted to talk about trying to save a river down in Georgia. This was a coastal river. And uh, somebody had a project for dumping coal ash on it from power plants. They were going to use it because it was stuck out of the way. They were going to use it to put something out of the way that other people didn't want in their way. And... Um, um, one of the interesting things that came out of that was that um, Bill, what's his name, the, the um, computer guy? Gates. Gates. Bill Gates. Gates. Yeah, he's a great environmentalist, you know. And um, Lover of GMOs. Yeah, he was, he was involved in this coal ash deal on a coastal river that the drainage was horrible and so on. I bet he didn't even know it. You see, I've been to his building out there in Seattle one time, and it's to the letter environmental. I hate that word, but it was perfect. And here he is, you know, his money, 
He's got all these billions of dollars just roaming around. <laughs> roaming that. around, doing damage. Yeah. I was see, he needs to be limited, you see. Be a big favor to cut him down to about a million. <laughs> 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 Wes. Uh, following, up on, on, following up on limits. Uh, following up on limits. Is this, is this working? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, since I was a college student back in the middle 50s, uh, I've been in and out of, mostly out, of uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, something will come along, and I think I want to get back into that again. And uh, but just uh, dealing with this matter of limits. If you remember, Dante wants to get into the angelic hierarchies, and he gets turned back by three awful animals. And he's wandering around in the dark wood, and Virgil comes along. And uh, they go on this field trip <laughs> through hell. <laughs> and uh, along this field trip, they're seeing all the suffering of all these different people that have uh, done bad things, sins of various sorts and so on. Now, they don't have to experience the direct themselves. They're not out there supine upon a plane of burning sand themselves. But, you know, they're, they're looking in on it. And uh, there's a kind of a hierarchy there. Uh, it gets worse as you get toward the middle. Uh, right dead center, by the way, is uh, um, treachery. And uh, the very worst one is treachery to benefactors. I think Dante had a grant. Um, <laughs> but he goes on out, and then... Uh, uh, but, the, but here's an acknowledgement of limits all along the way. Things that we should not be doing. And you may not like the order, and there may be some things that could be thrown out. But this is done in 1300 or so. I mean, this is an old, old problem of uh, acknowledging limits. Well, I was dealing with Paradise the other day, and uh, that is, I was reading Paradiso, and Virgil sort of in an abrupt manner hands off uh, Dante, and now he's, uh, he's got Beatrice. And they come to Dante's great, great grandfather, and he shows him his son, who is Dante's great-grandfather, that is in purgatory. And he's down there in purgatory in that little plane associated with pride. And then he says this very interesting thing. There has always been, this is a loose translation, pride in our family. It isn't good enough that this is a genetic problem. <laughs> it's not good enough. But here is the great, great grandfather there talking about his own son <laughs> that hasn't made it. And I think that's really interesting. We have no excuses. Mm -hmm. At least that's my interpretation. I'm not a Dante scholar at all. Uh, but why was that put in there? I think we have, in some respects, too many excuses today that we draw on. Of course, there are unfortunate <laughs> realities that cannot be overcome and so on. Uh, so I think we need field trips through hell. <laughs> and uh, we need... Uh, we need uh, Dante's great great grandpa to uh, give us some in some more insight. Uh, I wasn't much interested in Paradise until Wendell told me I should be reading Paradise more. 
uh, he he kind of he dwindles this way with paradise. He owes a lot to me. Huh? <laughs> so anyway, that's that's all about Tim about limits. All right. I mean that is I recommend it. Uh, I recommend that field trip. Okay. It's not really comforting to reflect that Dante lived all the way, all the way back there when people were not as smart as we yes. are. Yes, uh, well, that's the thing. I mean, if he'd had the internet, think what he would have done. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Uh, well, we're coming to our last topic and question, and this is, uh, I said earlier, we'd also talk about the crucial role of community, which all of you have not only um, written about and talked about and, and modeled ways to, um, to live in community well, uh, but you've even already been talking about it here. So most of us know by now that loving our neighbors, at least every single neighbor, doesn't come naturally. While one stereotype of farmers prefers the ornery individual Sustainable ag practitioners instead seem to prefer pitching in with neighbors and collaborating for shared good and working for the good of the entire community. David, I'm going to start with you. What makes investment in community and neighbors in love and friendship worth the effort for you? Well... I grew up in a strong community like that. My dad was a thrasherman. He thrashed for 25 families at one time. And he not only thrashed for our people, our people were the small part of it. But we had a large French Catholic neighborhood. We had Lutherans. We had Methodists, Wes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amish and Mennonites, and they all worked together for the good of the community get their crops in to, to work. And uh, I've told this story uh, when Tim and I, he was probably 13, 14 years old, we were plowing. He had the sulky plow and I had the walking plow and went up over the hill. We'd get it to the top of the hill, we'd rest the team and we'd talk. We'd visit back and forth and we turned around and we counted teams. And I must say the community isn't as active now as it was back then. But we counted 15 teams, or 17 teams, I forget, besides our own. And we knew if something would, we had a tragedy in our house, they would be there to help. They would unhitch and they would be there. And we've had, we've had not a number of deaths in our family and they're always there to help. The church, the neighbors, uh, it is uh, uh, the value of community. Uh, I don't think you can really measure it. It's almost unmeasurable. And we have, for instance, our community, um, we have, I don't know how many, our population doubles about every 20 years. We have a fairly high birth rate. Um, our, all the villages in East Homes, all of them are unincorporated, have no town council, have no mayor, and no cops. The only place in the United States is that way, and that's because of community. Yes, we trust these. We need trust. Uh, we can leave our doors open, even though many times we lock, but still, it's no, it's no big deal. And it, it is, you know, I have, Wendell said he's been outsmarted by sheep. I'll let the others answer, and then I have one sheep story I want to tell Wendell yet here <laughs> that uh, of a smart sheep. Oh, good. <laughs> Well, Wendell, what makes investment in community and neighbors in love and friendship? Well, I thought that was an interesting word, invest, and I had never applied that word to it. Um, uh, sometimes neighbors are sent to test your tolerance <laughs> and, and uh, uh, charity, and in that case, you need to, to be enough of a hypocrite to know how to act. Absolutely. Uh, if you've practiced on the people you actually love, then when you, the time comes, you may have to have to do it by road, so to speak. Um, but working together 
with with neighbors is the the finest thing I've ever done. Or well, one of them, two or three more. But um, for a long time, we in our place had a, an actual working neighborhood. And we were trading work, you know, and, and uh, nobody ever went out to do a big job alone. Sometimes it would be very moving. You'd think you were going out by yourself to do a little something, and here they'd begin to show up. That's very moving. Um, but when we were together, we were working, but we were also having fun. And I'll tell a, a, a story that matters a lot to me. Among the people who used to swap work with us was a, a, a fellow who had been crippled from a childhood disease. It wasn't polio, but he always said it was polio because he didn't want to explain. He, uh, he probably never weighed more than 125 pounds, but he never he did he did as much as anybody. He worked hard, and. Um, A friend of mine did a, a set of photographs of a tobacco harvest in 1973. And all of us were working in it at that time. And um, uh, we were still intact as a crew uh, and a, a group of neighbors, a neighborhood. And um, later, quite a bit later, those photographs were shown in uh, in Newcastle, and this fellow, his name was Eddie Sharp. Eddie realized that a lot of people who were looking at those pictures didn't know what they were about, and so he took a station at a certain point, and just was there to explain. He he enjoyed knowing and telling, but I heard him tell somebody one time, in in that occasion. That was hard work, he said. It was hard work. There wasn't any way you could do it to keep it from being hard. And then he said, but you wouldn't believe the fun we had. <laughs> that's why, that's, that's the interest on your principle, I reckon. <laughs> Wes, and then we'll have David's sheep story, and then we'll close. Again. Well, yeah, yeah. So. investment in community and neighbors in love yeah. and yeah. friendship. What makes it worth it? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you uh, what the uh, mission statement is of the Land Institute, and I think Wendell had a lot to do with helping, uh, or maybe even uh, doing it. But it, I won't give it all. But it goes like this: when people land and community are as one, all members prosper. When regarded as competing agents, all suffer. We're all, this is a creaturely life that we're having. And if it doesn't take much imagination to realize that the only renewability that is possible for a sunshine future that we're all talking about is our creatures. Us and what we need to sustain ourselves, the plants, the animals, and so on. And this is not done as individuals only. It is the relationship to the land and the community. And when that is as one, all prosper. Contrast that with what happens when there's an insertion of highly dense carbon into a system in the form of fossil fuels. And so 
the mines, the wellheads, the port of entry are all sources of driving out the cultural and biological information and replacing it with increasingly the industrial mind. Uh, the a wind machine is does not have renewability. It has to be it 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 can't die. It can't have a baby wind machine. Uh, a horse can have a colt. A tractor cannot have a baby tractor. Uh, so this creaturely world, I think, has to be our goal as a way of addressing the industrial mind. I'll tell you, I am far less bothered by some of the religious uh, fundamentalism that I see in the world, and the biggest problem is technological fundamentalism. The belief that we're going to solve our problems through technology. And so this creaturely world view, I think, has to be our, our goal. I don't like the word world view much. Wendell hates it even worse than I do. Uh, and, uh, but whatever you want to call it, a way. <laughs> uh, so we have a long history of being a part of a membership. First as gatherers and hunters and then later as agriculturists. <coughs> and when we started inserting the highly dense carbon, uh, into the system and I think the first one was with the Bronze Age and the Iron Age um, and what did they do in order to make that possible they cut the forests of Lebanon I've estimated it's an area about a third the size of, Can uh, of uh, Kansas and then of course the coal the oil the natural gas so I think there's a fundamental law really pretty close to that of Newton's law of gravity. The fundamental law is highly dense energy destroys information of the cultural and biological varieties. You insert that and you are on your way to some place on that journey, many places on that journey that Dante took us on. So, uh, yes, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> suppose, suppose we got a grant to put artificial intelligence to work on the 50-year farm bill. <laughs> they didn't clap. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's hear our sheep story. Uh, <laughs> now, in the sheep story, just a little bit on community. Uh, years ago, Wes told me, <clears throat> we were talking about community, how community works or doesn't work. And Wes said, actually, we need a little bit of deceit to have good community. That you really, the guy you can't stand, you are nice to him. You know, just civilization. My, my dad <clears throat> summed it up very well. You're all, he said, <clears throat> you're always glad to help, help your neighbor move. He's a good neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good neighbor. You're just so happy. It's an act of love. If he's not a good neighbor, you're happy to help him move too. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> now to the sheep that I'll, Sam, our local sheep shearer, he writes B. Tallman Farming Magazine. He shears sheep and he takes his border collie with him. And by the time he has just a Honda Power flexible shaft clipper, by the time he's set up, he thinks I'm ready in about 10 minutes. He sends the dog out, and the dog brings the sheep in, ready to be sheared. Now, he, he came to this farm, <coughs> to Willis Miller's, and he had a really mean sheep buck. And he wasn't home, but his wife told <coughs> Sam, don't. 
touch that buck, be careful, he's mean. Well, Sam and his son and the dog, the dog brought the buck in and Sam pinned him and he sheared him but left the mohawk on him. <laughs> and he painted that blue and turned him loose. <laughs> the owner wasn't happy. But, <laughs> but he outsmarted the buck. Okay, that's it. You know, a person bending over has a certain motion that's very like a buck getting ready yeah. to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he loves to hit from the back. So. Well, David, Wendell, and Wes, we thank you for this conversation, which is the keynote event of the 8th Annual Oak Conference. And we thank you as well for the ways you continue to light our dark times, reignite our commitments, and warm us with your insights and your hope. Thank you for being here. See? See? Ha <laughs> ha